So now we've got all the way to modern humans. And it's tempting to think that, oh, now we've got all this hospital care and we've got all this great agriculture and everything, that evolution has pretty much stopped. But it hasn't. What I want to do now is to introduce you to a few key points about evolution and sociality in modern humans. First off is it's possible to scan the genetic composition of people across the earth and look at different loci for evidence whether they're still subject to natural selection. And this chart shows roughly that in East Asians there seem to be about 185 different loci that are showing signs of recent selection. That would be because Hardy Weinberg is out of whack. Also about 188 loci in Europeans and about 200 in Africa. Okay, So 200 genes in each race of humans show signs of active selection. So there's differential survival and reproduction still going on in humans across the earth. But these are different genes. So the genes that are currently under subject that are being subject to natural selection in Europe are different from those genes that are being selected on in Asia and different again from those in Africa, suggesting that Asians are still getting adapted to the local conditions, the environment of Asia, Africans to Africa, and Europeans to Europe. So let's go back again. We're in history now, and we're going to say how some big innovations from our culture and our modern life produced new selection pressures. First was the domestication of livestock, which occurred in Africa and the Middle East about 10, 13,000 years ago. One of the things that this immediately caused is that you now got humans in very close physical contact with other species. And it turns out that we we're then subject to some of the diseases of livestock. And one of these, a classic one that I'll talk about again later in the course, is called Rinderpest. It's a virus that evolved once it got into humans to become measles. So measles, which we get our shots for, originated in livestock, which got into our species after we started domesticating livestock. But as we became pastoralists, we had a change in diet. Because once we had livestock hanging around, we just didn't just eat their meat, but we also milked them. So we had exposure to dairy products. Now, although all mammals start out drinking milk, the physiological ability to digest milk generally diminishes with age. And by the time most mammals are grown up, they're no longer able to digest lactose. But humans evolved the lactase enzyme so that adults can continue to drink milk, eat cheese, and all that. And these enzymes evolved in humans several times, uh, beginning about three to 10,000 years ago. So selection pressure, you'd have an advantage if you'd be able to digest milk as an adult, and voila, selection favored the origins of these enzymes. The next big step was plant domestication, which occurred between five and 10,000 years ago, again in the Middle East. And a key consequence of plant domestication is that humans now had a much more stable food supply and they could grow far more food and therefore could live at high population densities. But they also had to live close to water so they could irrigate their crops or there'd be enough rainfall in order to grow adequate crops. Where you have lots of people living close to each other and also living close to water, you have standing water, which is a great place for mosquitoes to breed their parasite, the malaria parasite, could then spread like crazy within humans. And so we seem to have developed a huge need to resist infection from malaria. And so genetic resistance to malaria appeared, again, several different loci, four different loci associated with resistance to malaria that evolved between three and 9,000 years ago. We already saw one of those with the sickle cell anemia, but there are three others besides that. And all of these under intense selection to be able to withstand the infection of malaria so they could continue to live in these agriculturally rich areas. Now, more recently still, as people have moved into new habitats, we're seeing rapid evolution. And this is well emphasized here by contrasting the modern Han Chinese with the Tibetans. 
The Tibetans live at very high altitudes. The plateau is about 13,000 feet. And there's only about 60% as much oxygen on the plateau as there is at sea level. Most of us would be quite uncomfortable trying to do any kind of physical labor at 13,000 feet, but the Tibetans rarely suffer from mountain sickness. Compared to the Han Chinese, from whom they descend, the Tibetans show significant evolutionary change in over 30 different genes as adaptation to life on the high plateau. And this has all happened in the last 3,000 years. So selection has favored a different phenotype in this high altitude that we can see quite clearly just in the last few thousand years. Now, a trait that is a clear adaptation to geography is also a trait that has caused a lot of societal problems in recent history, and that has to do with skin color. And what I want to show you now is how the color of one's skin reflects where your ancestors had resided for long periods of time. And what this shows is that there are certain parts of the planet where the level of exposure to ultraviolet light is really, really high. So obviously along the equator in the tropics, and particularly in open areas without much um, shade or anything. And as you go further north, there's less UV exposure. Okay? Now this is where skin color is typically very dark, is also in areas of high ultraviolet light. But let's go through this from the origins of the human species. Our closest living relative is the chimpanzee. The chimpanzee is covered with thick body hair, okay? And underneath their thick hair, they have white skin. They have white skin like I have white skin, okay? But humans lost their hair before they left Africa, okay? And without that thick hair, too much sunshine penetrates light skin, okay? And with too much light penetrating white skin, that breaks down vitamin B complex, which causes birth defects and male sterility, okay? So that's what selects for dark skin in strong sunlight, okay? So the first humans, once they lost their hair, they would have had to evolve very dark skin not to suffer from these consequences of breakdown of vitamin B, okay? But then as humans left Africa and they went to areas of low ultraviolet light, that dark skin blocks the sunshine and that inhibit, inhibits vitamin D production, okay? And if you can't produce enough vitamin D from being exposed to enough sunshine, you get skeletal deformities. So after humans left Africa, selection was quite intense, favoring lighter skin at higher latitudes, okay? So skin color is an adaptation to local geography, okay? Where dark skin is an adaptation to prevent that breakdown in vitamin B complex and light skin is an adaptation to allow vitamin D production in northern climates. So I mentioned that before humans left Africa, we lost our hair. What was that all about? Well, it turns out there's a trade-off between hair and sweat. Developmentally, there's sort of a choice that each local patch of skin can either produce a sweat gland, which allows perspiration to keep us cool, or to grow a hair follicle, okay? And so if you have fewer hair follicles, that allows more sweat glands. And then you can have more rapid evaporation of sweat, okay? So what we wanna think about is that these early humans were very active and they were sweating a lot. Now, where does that come from? Remember that Homo erectus was the first hominid with a modern gait, okay? They landed on their heel, they pushed off on their forefoot, they ran they would have worked up a sweat. This is an adaptation for running and long distance travel. Humans, it turns out, are better distance runners than any other primate. We could chase down a chimp or gorilla in any open field race ever. And in fact, if we run for very long periods, we can even run down bison, we can run down wildebeest, we can run down just about anything, because we can run and run and run and run, okay? And we're able to run and run and run and run because we have that gait but we're also able to keep ourselves cool. These other animals will overheat, okay? So humans are hairless so as to be able to sweat during 
prolonged bursts of physical activity. Now this is really an important thing to think about in our own lives. It turns out that to be smarter, to be healthier, there's no substitute for good exercise. That expensive energetic brain that we have needs to have exercise because the more we exercise, the more we produce a brain protein called BDNF. So this exercise produces production of the brain-derived neurotropic factor, and the production of that, stimulated by physical exercise, it improves our metabolism, it opposes neurodegeneration, that means it keeps our nerve cells healthy and happy, it works on our spine to lower our heart rate, it reduces the risk of obesity, it increases the connectivity of our neural networks, it improves oxygen use by the brain, it affects our mood, it's a great thing to do. Okay, so remember, whatever else you get out of this course, that the history of humans has been towards larger brains. We need to use our brains, and one of the best ways to keep our brains healthy is to exercise our bodies.